And a very good Friday to all the wonderful Christians in our Spectator Australia community. And happy long weekend to everyone else. I'm Gideon Rosner, this is Spectator Australia TV, and you're watching Counterculture, brought to you by all the hard-hitting content of the Spectator Australia and all the insightful research right here at the Institute of Public Affairs. Today we're doubling down on our war on woke, taking a look at Australia's so-called culture wars. The legendary Mark Latham tells us the real story behind Parliament's so-called toxic culture. The IPA's very own Dr. Bella Debrera exposes the critical race theory being taught in Australian, wait for it, kindergartens. James McPherson shares his thoughts on Joe Biden's latest woke ramblings and why Australians should be especially concerned. And as always, we have Rowan Dean sharing his special Easter message. And Sarah Dudley takes us back in time to two of our favourite Spectator Australia covers. All that and more coming up on this special Easter edition of Counterculture. Let's do it. Minister Payne will effectively become the leader of that group of women. Um, she is effectively, um, amongst her female colleagues, uh, the Prime Minister for women. <laughs> well, another week, another clanger for the Prime Minister. Look, to be fair to Skyma, when you think about it, it's pretty absurd that a man who's been happily married for 31 years, who has two daughters, and who has absolutely no allegations of sexist conduct against his name whatsoever, to be derided as some sort of menace to Australian women everywhere. But that's 2021 for you, where what you've actually done doesn't matter so much as what political team you're on, and actual deeds don't matter as much as gestures, posturing, woke symbolism. So now, for better or worse, rightly or wrongly, Scott Morrison is in an almighty political pickle, and he's finding it harder to get out of than a Wuhan townhouse. Now, it's tempting to laugh at ScoMo for his ridiculous quick fixes, like calling Maurice Payne the new Prime Minister of Women, as we've seen this week, like the captain of a new women's side in cricket or something. But to be fair to ScoMo, Tony Abbott went in the complete opposite direction when he was Prime Minister. He tried to elevate women's issues by appointing himself the relevant minister in 2013, and he was sneered at just as badly as Scott Morrison is being now. The bottom line with all this is that ScoMo can't win this debate because nobody really can, at least not on the conservative side of politics. When you have the wrong politics, they'll call you a sexist no matter what you do. And if you have the right politics, well, you can basically get away with just about anything. But there are some politicians who do get it and refuse to play the left's game. One of them is Mark Latham, who, as always, took some much-needed common sense in this weekend's edition of The Spectator Australia. Among other things, Mark Latham makes the point that Scott Morrison has walked into the left's trap conceded ground and willfully legitimised the campaign against him. So, let's hear now from great Australian patriot, member of the New South Wales Upper House, and most importantly of all, Spectator Australia favourite, the great Mark Latham. Mr Latham, how are you? Oh, well, Gideon, after that introduction, I'm fantastic. I, it's always great to be called great. I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. Good on you. <laughs> Excellent. Now, um, jumping straight into your excellent, excellent piece in The Spectator Australia, uh, you said that... Through all the commentary of the toxic culture in Canberra, the media are basically getting it wrong. And as a star former staff myself, I don't necessarily disagree, but what's your take on it? Well, Canberra has its problems, mainly because it's an artificial city, an artificial centre of government. So uh, people stay there out of necessity and, and they tend to practise politics 24-7. Hmm. Um, so I, I think that aspect of the Canberra experiment has failed in that the 24-7 focus on politics out at dinner at restaurants and cafes plotting against each other and the power of the uh, the factional heavies, uh, all of that has produced a fairly toxic environment. But, um, you know, it's also true that uh, there are many political offices in Canberra where the culture is different. Uh, I, I would say that the, the media reporting is very simplistic. To talk about one workplace culture in Canberra is an absurdity. Just as every member of parliament is different, uh, you'd find there are you know, a couple of hundred different workplace cultures in Parliament House building in Canberra, just as the MPs themselves have got different temperament, ideology, outlook. So the generalisations, I think, are very unfair on those parliamentary offices, which are collegiate, cooperative, people working together. You're right, and I was fortunate enough to work for great uh, politicians who ran great offices. And another proposal that's been floated is for more family-friendly hours in federal 
Parliament. Now that, uh, uh, you know, reducing the sitting hours to end at 6pm or something. Now that's great if you're the member for Canberra, but you know as well as I do that being an MP means you fly in, you spend all day at the building. If you're away from your family anyway, it just means you're away twice as long. And what are you going to do after hours? Go out to public, uh, get on it. Uh, it might very well make the situation worse, not better. Oh, absolutely. Um, people would go out to the restaurants at 6pm instead of 9 or 10 p.m. And, and start their potting earlier. And it's in that toxic environment. You get the rumour mill. Um, you, you get people more interested in, in power and revenge and doing in others mm. than actually doing their job for the, for the public benefit. I think if there is a solution about Canberra, it's to spend less time there. Yeah. Um, the, the parliament doesn't seem to do uh, uh, the business that it did the, the legislative uh, the weight that it carried uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So you could reduce the number of sitting days and the more time a Member of Parliament spends out in their constituency with normal people uh, going home at night with their family leading a much more normal life away from the uh, toxic environment in Canberra, I think that's uh, an improvement uh, in, in political culture that would be worthwhile. And now you've written about why this is happening now and what it's doing to Scott Morrison. That's a recurring theme on this show. You wrote that Scott Morrison has had Eddie Maguire syndrome. Now that sounds like another, uh, you know, terrible, uh, wicked virus and an invisible enemy to me. But uh, what do you mean by Eddie Maguire syndrome? It seemed to me that um, if you're of a fairly mainstream working class background, and for social climbing reasons, you invite the woke people into your world and basically say, oh, here's the standard now by which I'm living. Well, it's inevitable. They'll cut you down uh, savagely at a time of their choosing because you're basically saying, I'll live now by the woke standards. It's impossible to live up to them. Mm. Uh, they would have had Eddie's card marked at every opportunity. And Scott Morrison strikes me the same thing. He's now conceded. So many uh, the points about um, uh, he's talking about unconscious bias against women. Uh, what, what is that? Uh, unconscious bias is some kind of medieval superstition. <laughs> Unproven. It's, it's used to try and say that working people have got all these racist, uh, misogynist, homophobic thoughts in the back of their head and uh, they're automatically and permanently deplorable. So yeah. when you've got Scott Morrison conceding that you need a workplace culture review, you need a workplace yeah. culture overhaul. We've got to end the unconscious bias against women. We've got to have tribunals, kangaroo courts. We've got to do all the processes that uh, the left feminists call for. He has surrendered his world uh, to wokeness and inevitably they'll cut him down. He'll never meet their standards and that has never satisfy their demands. Mm. And when you invite them into your world, it is Eddie Maguire syndrome. They cut you down when it suits them. And and it's not like Scott Morrison is stupid politically. He might be a bit of a disappointment, uh, to put it mildly, policy-wise, but Scott Morrison is somebody who never goes into an issue or never talks about an issue that he knows won't play well for him personally. Yet on this women's business, a fight that he will never, ever win, by the way, he has gone, he has fallen over himself to talk about it non-stop at the expense of whatever his agenda is supposed to be. What is it about these kind of issues that draws somebody like Scott Morrison in almost like quicksand. Well, he's a bit of a do-gooder and he probably <laughs> thinks he does need to do good on this issue and can't stop talking about it uh, without actually ever saying much. Um, and, you know, for his political opponents, it's a devastatingly effective uh, tactic because the ABC and the, 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 the Labor left and, and all the lovies were so biased against him um, at the last election campaign, they couldn't beat him on climate and tax policy, you'd have to say on COVID, he was riding high. So they worked out, let, let's wrong foot Scott Morrison on an issue he wouldn't have thought about much, he yeah. wouldn't know much about sex scandals. You yeah. know, I, I don't think Scott would have had a sex scandal in his life or Correct. too much upfront understanding. So they wrong footed him and get him into foreign territory politically. Mm. He doesn't know what to do. He looks permanently off balance, confused. Uh, um, you know, what he, he cried at one press conference. He keeps talking about what his <laughs> wife and children would think about it. I mean, he's been a shambolic uh, mess all over the place. So for his opponents, it's been a gift to get him into this uh, foreign territory where he doesn't really know what he's doing and he can't stop talking about it. Why is the media class, the political class, still going down this road, these inane culture wars over this kind of issue when clearly mainstream Australians just reject it? Well, it's an interesting question. You know, several years ago, we had in Australia the attempt to 
popularize the hashtag Me Too yeah. movement, just copying what, what had been happening in the United States. And the, the left feminists here copied the US experience, trying to target actors and celebrities, entertainment types, and they didn't get very far with that. Uh, in fact, they didn't get anyone convicted. So I, I think what we've seen uh, this year really is an attempt to resurrect the, the Me Too movement. Uh, they've turned their guns onto Parliament House and politics in Canberra with a lot more success given the coverage they've uh, they've achieved. And unfortunately, you know, it's part of a long-term pattern in our society where leftists want to demonise all men. Part of their identity politics and, and, and their outlook on, on working people being deplorable is to say that every man, particularly a white-skinned man, is a predator, um, has got the toxic masculinity, uh, is not to be trusted around women, uh, has no respect for women, when the truth is 99% of men are protectors yep. of women, uh, not violators, and, and you've only got to look at natural disasters, uh, floods and bushfires, when the men go in to save their uh, loved ones, their wife and children, get them to safety, then they go back to try and save the property that the family relies on. This will all end in tears. What's your biggest fear about the trajectory that we're heading down with all this stuff? Oh, undoubtedly, my biggest fear is that it's such a, a bad time for a young man to be growing up yeah. in Australia. And that news out of Victoria of a school that foolishly made young men stand Shocking. up for, to apologise for the sexual assaults of, of other unnamed men. Now, you know, we have a big debate about mental health. But why have we got in schools in particular consultants and 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 and, and vicious uh, left feminists going into these schools basically to drive down the self-esteem and the confidence of young men? I, I've heard of seminars in New South Wales schools where they bring in the consultants who will hector the young men to say, you are a potential domestic violence perpetrator. You are uh, guilty of toxic masculinity. Things that you say to your friends will make them suicide. And, and yeah. the young men come out of these uh, sessions at schools and say, I went in there with, you know, sort of half-decent self-esteem. I came out deflated and demoralised. Mm. Now, what about their mental health? Yeah. Shouldn't we be building up our young men to give them self-esteem and confidence to meet the challenges of society and go out and succeed as adults? This is a crime against young men. That's the worst thing about it, mm. the unfair, unreasonable demonisation that spans right into our schools is a crime against uh, a major proportion of our population and, and needs to be seen in that context. Mark Latham, thank you so much for coming on Counterculture today. Excellent piece as always. I hope we see a lot more of it. Yeah, for sure, Gideon. Always happy to chat. Cheers, mate. Now, if you're enjoying this show, please subscribe to this channel, Spectator Australia TV, and please give this video a like. As I always say, we need to beat big tech censorship, and thanks to you, we are beating big tech at its own game. We're hacking away at that algorithm, and we're getting the message out. Thanks to your liking, your sharing, your subscribing, your clicking, we are reaching thousands of Australians each and every week. So keep going, keep helping us get the message out. But what is the message? Well, let's ask our Editor-in-Chief, Rowan Dean. Rowan, how are you? I'm good, mate. How are you, Gideon? Very well. Now, this is a special Easter weekend edition of Counterculture. You have written a special Easter message to Spectator Australia subscribers. You know, it's an exciting period of time, but politically, I'm afraid it's quite the opposite. And uh, if uh, Scott Morrison is hoping for some kind of rebirth or... Uh, you know, a new flowering of uh, his popularity. Uh, I'm afraid the decisions he took this week uh, don't live up to that and aren't going to supply it. On these lockdowns, you know, uh, let's be honest, are you surprised that we're back here? Are you really surprised? I'm not. I'm not surprised, but the, the tragedy of it all is the pointlessness, the futility and, and the utter waste of human resources, horrible expression, but uh, lives, jobs, uh, you know, livelihoods, lifestyles that are just being trashed by the state premiers for no reason whatsoever. Nowhere in the world, Gideon, mm. has it been shown that lockdowns do anything to prevent Correct. the spread of COVID. Nowhere, nowhere in the world. In fact, often the evidence is the contrary and you compare places, uh, states in America where they've had severe lockdowns to states in America where they've had very few and there's no difference in the ultimate uh, or very little difference in the ultimate outtake. So why we are doing this again uh, is a tragedy beyond belief. Uh, the Queensland, the Labor premiers of Queensland, Victoria and West Australia, people will look back in future years and go, you cruel, cruel people. You've also touched on another 
disastrous week for Scott Morrison. This women's issue is like quicksand. The more he is moving, the more he is being drawn into it. Um, he's announced triumphantly a prime minister for women. Can we, can we just have a prime minister for conservatives, for Australians, for Australian <laughs> patriots? How about we start there and then we have a prime minister for all the other identity groups? The problem is uh, Scott Morrison, as you said, quicksand is the best analogy. You cannot win if you play identity politics. You will never, ever win. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, satiating the beast of identity politics. So the more you feed it, the more it will demand. This was a real tragedy for the Liberal Party, for the coalition uh, this was the week uh, Scott Morrison basically abandoned all sense of uh, any kind of centre-right or conservative principles and just went hollis bolus in with uh, the craziness of identity politics and hoping that somehow putting a bunch of Sheilas in place will uh, solve problems that uh, his supposedly uh, talented team of ministers were incapable of solving. This is insane. Uh, people elect their representatives based on who they want. They expect their representatives to be treated on merit, not on genitalia. It's a disaster. And even when you do have talented women being appointed into the ministry, like Amanda Stoker, who is one of the best people in our parliament, well, Absolutely. the Identity Politics Brigade is raining down hell no because she's the wrong kind of woman with the wrong kind exactly. of opinions. So that just shows how transparent and idiotic the whole spectacle has become. Now, uh, on a completely different matter, it's ALP National Conference Week and, of course, for the fifth year in a row or whatever it is, uh, the ALP are forgetting about Australia's problems and focusing on a pretend country, which is the non-existent state of Palestine. So what are your views on the ALP's national conference and the, their fixation on this issue? Gideon, it, we've seen in Labor UK, for example, uh, as well as other places, that when the left start uh, toying with these sorts of issues, uh, they actually uh, are really, it is often a case of camouflaging anti-Zionism or yep. even anti-Semitism. Uh, and so you play with the Palestinian, uh, get, you play the Palestinian game at your peril. Let's not forget uh, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and certainly Hamas in Gaza are virtually or, in fact, terrorist organisations that don't hold free elections, that uh, terrorise their own people to, con to maintain power. Correct. Uh, Donald Trump wisely avoided the Palestinian issue altogether and successfully managed several peace treaties between Israel and Arab states something everyone said could never be done. Uh, Labor completely either clueless or deliberately uh, uh, avoiding recognising that fact and by encouraging the Palestinians as, uh, as they are to go for statehood, they are encouraging automatically the death of Jewish, innocent Jewish people, uh, because that is how the Palestinians have responded in the past. Well, the good news on the uh, Israel front, uh, I guess, is that it looks like Benjamin Netanyahu uh, may very well be re-elected yet again, uh, the best leader that the Jewish people have had since Moses, in my humble opinion, speaking with some authority <laughs> on the matter. So uh, whatever the Labor Party says and does, there's a still a, 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 a strong man at the helm who is capable of protecting uh, Israel and protecting its right to exist, even if the Australian Labor Party will not. Anyway, to you, Rowan, have a great long weekend. Thanks for all the hard work you've done on this excellent edition of The Spectator Australia. Uh, looking forward to catching up again. See you, mate. Have a great Easter. Cheers, mate. And remember, if you want to read more more from our outstanding stable of talent right here at The Spectator Australia, just head on over to spectator.com.au. And if you like what you see, and we know you absolutely will, subscribe to The Spectator Australia today to get instant access to all of our outstanding content, including the weekly Spectator Australia magazine, all the articles in our online section, Flat White, and great international authors like Douglas Murray, Brendan O'Neill, James Dillingpole, and many, many, many others. Just call 1800 809 233 and quote Spectator Australia TV. Your starting position in this race will be decided by the answers to questions that we are going to be asking you. Okay, what? If English is your parents' first language, oh. take a step forward. Oh, yeah. If you have ever been the only person in the room of your race, Take a step backwards. It's kind of frustrating that like me and Sarah are just standing at the back here while the majority of people who may be white are like standing right at the front. That just frustrates me a bit because it's almost as in what society is today.
I, w I don't want this to be how it is, but it is. So it just gets a bit frustrating. Well, if you're anything like me, uh, you found that pretty hard to watch. Horrifying, in fact. You know, let, let's make no bones about this. What you have just witnessed is primary school children in England being divided along racial lines. You know, I used to think that saying no to racism meant getting beyond our historical and centuries-old fixation with race. I thought it meant forgetting about race. I didn't think that it meant spending every waking second talking about nothing but bloody skin colour and obsessing with terrible injustices like this, for example. First, white privilege provides white people with perks. Some perks go unnoticed, like being able to actually use complimentary shampoo and conditioner at a hotel. Hey, I get it. I, of all people, understand the terrible trauma of not having your preferred shampoo on hand. But, I mean, come on. Now, some may argue that it's important to teach our kids that racism is wrong, and that may be true. But maybe when it comes to kids and racism, we should stick with the classics, like this. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Anyway, this is all important because critical race theory isn't just being foisted on kids in br dreary British documentaries. It's happening to our kids in Australian schools. And in this weekend's edition of The Spectator Australia, the IPA's Dr Bella De Brera lays out the horrifying detail, details of her research into the matter. Let's hear from her now. Well, now we welcome back to Counterculture from the Institute of Public Affairs, Dr. Bella Debrera. Congratulations on being our first returning guest to Counterculture. So let's get right into it. Uh, Anti-racism training for kids. Now, what are primary age children learning about anti-racism right now in Australian schools? Well, this is New South Wales, just to be just to be to to specify where it is. Um, but it's actually kindergarten children as well. It's not really, kindergarten. They're starting. They're starting at three and four year olds because you're joking. Is, I, I wish I was joking. Mm. So at the moment, they're giving three and four year olds a um, an introduction to anti-prejudice training. Mm. They're not really talking about racism at this point. They're getting into right. this idea of difference. Um, yeah. And um, they're using subtle techniques. They're talking about un understanding difference and mm. understanding, you know, why you're different to the little person that you're playing with next door. Yeah. Um, and they're using things like uh, Dr. Zeus's The Sneetches, which, right. which is quite funny because, you know, yeah. this was this is now banned material. Yeah, correct. So they're going to have to get onto that. And I thought Dr. Zeus is racist now. They're using Dr. it for anti-racism training. Yes. <laughs> From what you've written for The Spectator Australia, that's just an entree into the next course, which is for what, pri you know, getting into deeper into primary school. What does that look like? Yeah, so they work their way up um, yeah. quite subtly. They're very right. clever about this. This is not talking immediately to three-year-olds about um, racial privilege and, yeah. and white privilege. No. So by the time they get sort of 10, 10 years old, they're starting to te teach them about how to recognise racism. Right. Um, and they're introducing them to the idea of racism being a problem in their school, yeah. in their classroom. Mm. Um, it's becoming more personalised, you know. Right. Perhaps you're a racist and you don't know. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that they're getting. So, that you know, look at the teacher's notes and you look so at the classroom primary activities. primary school kids are already being told you may be a latent racist and not even yes, know about this it. Yes, this is when they're 10. So you're, they're already imparting this original sin of whiteness. Yes. So what does what then yeah. happen when when high school rock, uh, uh, arrives? Yeah, well, so they get to 13. 13 or 14, so between 13 and 16, they're yeah. getting um, lessons on institutional racism. Mm. So they've already told them that there's a problem with their own race, yeah. and now they're telling them that there's a, there's a more general problem, uh, <laughs> which is which is the problem of, of institutions in yeah. Australia. They're yeah. saying that um, that the, our political, our, our governmental, uh, our right. healthcare is all institutionally racist, right. okay. um, and. And they're telling us that, that, that there's a problem with the Australian flag. Uh, so one of the classroom activities is to say, have a look at the emblems on the flag and do you think this is still relevant for Australia in 20, 2021? It's this recurring theme. So yeah. uh, by around primary school, they, they start being taught to basically hate themselves. Yeah. Um, and towards the end, it's hating their country. This is frightening. Well, yes, and then and then later on, then you get the whole critical race theory yeah. um, unleashed on the sort of the, the older students, mm. which is which is even worse. Yeah. Um, so I think we need to talk about it because it's insidious. Mm. Um, and this is imported straight out of America. This is, yeah. America is just totally obsessed with race at the moment. And yeah. critical race theory is now the dominant ideology in schools there. We do not want to reach a stage in Australia where you have marauding gangs going around burning down Starbucks and so on. We do not want that here. But this is, the, as you said, this is how it starts. Yeah, unfortunately, this is this is the logical conclusion. This is where this goes. Um, so critical race theory is, is, is 
a, a rehash of the Marxian dichotomy of bourgeois versus proletariat. Mm. They've just made it white versus black. Mm. That is so wrong and that is so dangerous. Yeah, and it's not making us any more harmonious as a society. It's not making us any happier. It's not, make, it's not doing anything to advance the cause of, say, Aboriginal disadvantage. Uh, no. None of this is helping anybody with anything. So why do we persist with it? There's an element of uh, a utopianism about it. Mm. Um, as there is with all these ideologies that come out of the left, this 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 realization that there is an equality. Mm. Um, how do we fix that? We we fix that by by telling all white people that they are the problem. Yeah. And we fix that by saying, well, then our institutions are the problem because they're racist. Yeah. But the problem is that there's no vision. There's no vision for post destruction of these institutions. No, it's just wholly nihilistic. It's wholly nihilistic. Yeah. Um, with no vision, as I said, and yeah. no, and you have to have this blind belief. In, in, in what comes next, even though they haven't actually told us what comes next. But this is a problem with conservative, uh, the conservative uh, right side of politics yeah. is that we've long uh, abandoned the idea of culture wars and just handed it to the left. Because nobody um, wants to pick the fight. Nobody wants to pick the fight. And the language yeah. that the left uses, as you say, is very clever because yeah. who's, who's going to say, no, we need more racism? Yeah. The other problem with the idea of white privilege is that yeah. as soon as you start arguing with the idea of white privilege, they say, ah, oh, that's evidence that you've got that's evidence yeah. of your white privilege. Yeah. So it's a circular that's white fragility. that you can never win. There is room for optimism in all of this because parents have been fighting back. I mean, there was a school in Warrnambool recently where they did push back against some of the craziness of this identity politics. Yeah, look, this is not the race, this is the gender, this is the other aspect of no, the identity politics. The um, so the, the, these 13-year-olds were made to stand up in, in an assembly and apologise mm. to all the girls for, for, for crimes they hadn't committed. <laughs> horrific crimes of rape and went home and told their, t said to the parents, I'm, I'm, not a ra I'm not a racist. Ugh. And the backlash was just a yeah. tsunami of backlash, yeah. which, is, which really is very heartening mm. uh, because it does show that this, is, this, this critical race theory, this identity politics, yeah. this, is not the, this is not mainstream Australia. No, it isn't not. mainstream Australia. And it values. never will be. And we, can, and we can't conflate what, Austra what Australia's political and cultural elite are doing with what mainstream Australian values are. And we should mm. always have faith in Australia and the common sense of the people. In it, and people will fight back. This will end, but we have to talk about it. We have yep. to shine a light on it. We have to build a cat here. Uh, and uh, on that note, we'll thank you for the work you do here at the IPA and exposing this stuff. Well done on an excellent piece. Again, as always, in the Spectre Australia and uh, looking forward to inviting you on for your third appearance, a hat trick. I can't wait. Thank you. And now let's take a look at what you had to say in the YouTube comment section of last week's episode. James answers my question to you last week in relation to what our government should be focused on. He says, what should we do? Fight the culture wars. Well, I couldn't have put it better myself, James. The so-called culture wars are not a distraction, they, they matter. They involve very real issues affecting our basic freedoms and the country we want to live in. But the good news is that we here at Counterculture are on the front line, as always. Now, Oliver talks common sense on women's safety, saying, I've taught my daughter judo as self-defense, but I've also taught her common sense to go along with it. She understands that walking through the streets at 3am is not ideal. Well, that's very well said, Oliver. Look, should women be able to walk the streets safely? Absolutely, everybody should. But no amount of prime ministers for women or other gimmicks will change the fact that there are evil, sick people in the world. And advice on safety is not necessarily victim blaming. Now, one of our favorite commenters on the channel, Megan, uh, picked up on the photo of a young me shared last week, and she says, the real crime is that haircut, ah, the 90s. Hey, hey, Megan, hey. That photo was taken in 2003, not the 90s. But point taken, in fact, that probably makes it worse. And finally, Harry writes, finally, the vaccine to the virus that is the modern left is here. Thank you for the weekly injection of sanity and truth that counterculture provides. It gives me great hope that there is some willing to speak the truth on principle, not on partisanship. Well, thank you so much, Harry. That is so kind. We love that you're enjoying the show. We love being your voice for common sense and Australian values. And most of all, we love a good compliment. So congratulations, you are the winner of this week's special mystery prize, a signed copy of Corkscrew, the hilarious novel written by The Spectator Australia's very own Rowan Dean. Now, if you missed out on this week's prize, don't worry, you can still get a free copy of the book that's signed by Rowan Dean by joining the IPA. So watch out for that deal a bit later in the show. But until then, it's time to look at this week's front cover with the lovely Sarah Dudley. Sarah, how are you? Hi, Gideon. Great, thank you. Great to have you. Now, we've chosen to do a bit of a retrospective this Easter weekend, and we've chosen two particular covers covering a particular uh, former political figure or current political figure, depending on which way you look at it. So what made you want to look at this particular former politician and current nuisance in particular? Well, 
I suppose um, resurrections in the air, isn't it, Gideon? <laughs> yeah, so so that's the motivation. Yeah. Yes, and um, in particular, the two covers, well, um, they're from 2018. Um, and that was the year, of course, um, when Hollywood had its normal film festivals yep. and the big winner of the Oscars was three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Mm. I don't know if you remember that one, Gideon. I never saw it, yeah. And so it was also a time when there was something else that was in the air that everyone was talking about, Um, and that was the number of news polls that um, the then Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, was fast approaching. Mm. 28, 29... 30, I remember the day. And he yeah. would equal that magic number, the number that he said would be a good enough reason for Tony Abbott to be dumped. Mm. And here he was, the yep. irony of it, about to reach that landmark himself. Um, and so that seemed like absolutely the perfect opportunity to combine those two events mm. and turn them mm. into the one cover, which we did. Mm. And that mm. was three billboards outside ACT, Canberra, 28, 29, 30, bingo, there you go. The man's almost gone, yep. um, which he was. And, in fact, in um, ooh, by August, he was gone. And on the 1st of September, we ran a cover in which he was binned, you know, quite <laughs> literally on the front cover. Um, and we see him in a... Bin and it's got this sign on it saying stenciled on the side not for recycling which of course was what everyone was hoping for because no one particularly wanted to remember um, all of the climate change measures that mm. he tried to foist on Australia that had been voted against many times mm. um, and people the only climate change measure they were particularly interested in that week was clearing the air and saying goodbye, adieu to Malcolm Turnbull. But that wasn't to be. And in actual fact, yeah. he's being resurrected. Yeah, he's being recycled. And by a Liberal government too. Um, Matt, you know, Matt Keane, you know, what can I say? Mm. He's... Um, he's elevating him to the chair of um, this new energy board. Um, and, well, you know, you might think it's terrific. Mm. You might hate it. But I think one thing certain is that it's not the kind of resurrection story that you want to celebrate. Can, can we stop using uh, resurrection and Malcolm Turnbull? Re- resurrection, as I understand, is supposed to be for the Messiah, and a Messiah, Malcolm Turnbull, ain't. I mean, a lot of people thought that circa 2015 and then before that in 2009, but that is certainly not the case. Um, but you're right, this is, a, this is a, a shock. I mean, if nothing else, it's shocking optics for the Berejiklian government. You have Matt Keane appointing his factional mentor to a what I presume to be a public subsidised, taxpayer-funded position, sharing some you know, oh garbage, board, garbage board, sitting around with other similarly well-heeled people probably to talk about how to fling other people's money at windmills and solar farms. It's just uh, a, a ridiculous preposition and uh, only somebody uh, with the political antenna of Matt Keane could think it's a very good, uh, could think it's a good idea. And Carla Spirajikli, and there's a lot going for her, but the people sitting around her cabinet table uh, is not one thing that's going for her. Now, uh, the Spectator cover, a Spectator Australia cover this week is uh, an Easter-themed cover. Uh, what are you uh, doing for the long weekend? I actually have been invited to a hen party in Byron Bay. Is that right? Um, but I don't think that that's going to happen oh. somehow. Oh, there's just no justice in the world. Well, I'll tell you, I've got a trip to Cairns. Uh, book later this year, and I don't care how many lockdowns Bloody Palaszczuk orders, I will tunnel from Collins Street to Coolangatta and hitchhike if I have to That's to get into Queensland. Nothing will Absolutely. stop me from going to God's own country, the wonderful free state of Queensland. But uh, anyway, Sarah, well, thank you so much. Have a great long weekend, and uh, as always, can't wait to, wait to see what you have for us next week. Yeah, you too, Gideon, and enjoy all those chocolate Easter eggs. I will be. And now let's see what else is on offer at the Spectator Australia this Easter. Drew the Sloan takes a sledgehammer to what I think is the most important issue in the country right now, spending and debt. Trust me, this is a must read. 
Fan favourite James Allen offers his thoughts on this week's goings on, including proposing a new centre-right political party. An excellent idea in my opinion. Over at Flat White, Victorian MP the great Bev MacArthur demolishes Chairman Dan over his insane anti-democratic ban on fracking written into Victoria's constitution. And for your amusement, if nothing else, Kevin Rudd has taken a break from having a go at the Murdoch media is now coming after us instead. Read his letter to the editor online. And of course, you can find links to all these stories and more in the show notes down below or go and check them out at spectator.com.au. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for The Morning Double Shot, a daily edition of Spectator Australia goodness brought to you by editor Terry Barnes. Terry is up bright and early scanning the news and offering you your first shot of comment for the day, helping you make sense of whatever madness the morning news brings. Plus your daily highlights of what The Spectator Australia is saying about the issues that matter. Morning Double Shot arrives at 7am each and every morning, so check it out, sign up, and be informed. Miss Swanson, how does it feel to be competing today? I can't tell you how free I feel now that I've started identifying as a woman. Now that I can compete as female, I'm ready to smash the other girls. And is it correct you just started identifying as female two weeks ago? I'm not here to talk about my transition. I'm here to kick some f***ing ass. It'd be funny if it weren't so sad for so many female athletes. As you all know, the issue of transgender athletes in women's sport has become another minefield for, well, anyone with common sense, as usual. Now, as always, let me be perfectly clear. This is not about picking on transgender people. I would never do that. I'm happy when people are happy. I have nothing but respect for people who go through a difficult transition to be their real and authentic selves. In many cases, people I know personally. You know, that's great. That is genuinely wonderful that people have that option and they are exercising it. It really is. But that doesn't mean that we should be okay with the unfair and obvious advantage that many, not all, but many transgender people have in women's sport. Joe Biden's okay with it, though. On his first day in office, Biden signed an order invoking anti-discrimination law to force American schools to allow transgender athletes to compete against biological women in all cases, no matter how unfair the advantage. It's it's symptomatic of the kind of woke ideology that Joe Biden has sleepily been going along with, an ideology that can't seem to make up its mind on whether we live under a rigid patriarchy with men oppressing women or we live in a society where gender is a social construct and it doesn't matter. Anyway, in a piece for Flat White this week, Spectator Australia regular James McPherson takes a hilarious look at Joe Biden's confused outlook at all things gender. Let's hear from him now. James McPherson, how are you? I'm very well, Gideon, and thanks for having me on the program. I've been loving it. Much appreciated, mate, and the chicks in the mail. Now, getting right down to business, you've written a great piece for Flat White Online talking about Joe Biden's uh, crazy leaning in to the identity politics of the left, in particular the the transgender, ongoing transgender debate. Uh, Talk us through your very funny, very entertaining, very insightful piece on Flat White. Well, Gideon, 64 days after being inaugurated as president, Joe Biden's minders, by whom I mean Kamala Harris and uh, Bernie Sanders, finally allowed him to address the 80 million people who voted for him. (laughs) And in the course of that address, Biden said there's not a single thing, not a single thing, Gideon, that a man can do Mm. that a woman can't do as well or better. Mm. Now, a quick-witted journalist should have asked, did he mean like walking upstairs? But uh, this is a classic case of ideology trumping biology. Mm. Joe Biden is now so woke and so progressive, he's progressed beyond the need of science or even of basic life experience because we know for a fact there are many things that women cannot do as well as a man. Most of them relate to physical activities. Roger Bannister, 1954, broke the four-minute mile and thousands of men have done so over the past 70 years. But do you know how many women have broken the four-minute mile? I I don't think any. Not a single one. Look, I see where this is going and here you and I are two men talking about women's issues. We'll come under fire for that. And look, I can see the point or the counterpoint to all this. We should be encouraging our girls to do, uh, to aspire to everything that men can. But, you know, don't take our word for it as two blokes. Let's talk to women in women's sport who are complaining about this, who are saying we cannot compete against these biologically male athletes. Give us a fair go. The point you make is brilliant, Gideon, for this reason. Uh, Equality and difference are not mutually exclusive. In fact, 
recognising differences in the sexes as complementary to each other breeds appreciation for the sexes. But to say there's no difference, so therefore there's no appreciation of complementarity, instead you're left with competition. And when there's a competition between the sexes, the physically stronger sex wins every time. That's the problem with women's sport. There's such an internal contradiction to this debate because on the one hand we're told that women's issues are so important, we need to have a women's minister, we need to have women's departments, we need to have this and that and everything else. On the other hand, we're told that, well, gender's just a social construct and it's all made up anyway and you can be anything you want. We, how can we hold these two contra contradicting ideas in our head as a society and not be completely confused and, uh, and melting down as we are now? Well, Gideon, there's your problem. See, you cannot be a leftist unless you can hold two completely contradictory <laughs> views at the same time. So stop trying to work it out, just go with it and live with the contradiction. It's the only way you can survive in a progressive culture. We're seeing this play out in Canberra. This is not just a Joe Biden issue. This is a Scott Morrison issue. All we've talked about for the better part of a month is women's issues. And I get it. Again, there are some uh, you know, issues uh, there to be resolved. Of course there are. But this is something I asked more my guests last week because I'm fascinated by this dynamic that Scott Morrison has as far as I'm aware, and I don't think has ever mistreated a woman in his life, yet he had to personally apologise on behalf of the men in Australia. I mean, isn't that a little unfair, if nothing else? It, it's completely unfair. And Scott Morrison has a problem because he has, for the better part of three years, avoided the culture wars and has said he's not interested in them. But, but here's the thing, the culture wars are interested in him. Hmm. And so Scott Morrison now is being played like a puppet and is suddenly promoting quotas, which he's never promoted before, but as a way of trying to placate the mob. And you can't placate the mob. You've got to stand by principles. You've got to outline some fundamental, unchanging principles. Scott Morrison has failed to do that, and now he's making it up as he goes, and, and it's, it's not good enough. No, no, it isn't. And and uh, the point has been made by Roe and other people on this program. He He's falling for a competing set of values because he hasn't established his own. Uh, and, he, and we've heard it said that, you know, culture wars don't build a road and, you know, it doesn't matter if you're too woke and so on. I mean, really, uh, has Scott Morrison sort of made his own bed here? Pardon the pun. Well, well yes, he has. And it, it's one that uh, he can't sleep comfortably in. <laughs> For a start, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, who called um, uh, Brittany Higgins a lying cow? It, mm. it was a minister, a female Minister, yep. Um, who failed to take the complaints uh, seriously and and go through due process? It was a female minister, uh, so this is not strictly a issue that can be solved by introducing more women into cabinet. Women were part of some of the problems that have been created. I'm not saying all of the problems, but it's not as simple as we just need to replace a bunch of mediocre men with a bunch of equally mediocre women and and the whole situation is solved. It, yeah. It's not like that. No, it's not like that at all. And you and Rowan made the very same point last week that this idea of, you know, uh, shoveling more women, any old woman into uh, parliament to mitigate this, it wouldn't have prevented any of the issues that we've seen. And frankly, I don't think it would prevent any issues going forward. But look, to you, James McPherson, thank you so much for coming on. Excellent, excellent piece in Flat White. Keep them coming. Love your writing style and your humour and everything else that you bring into it and hope to see a lot more of you here on Counterculture. Thanks, Gideon. Well, this program is a co-production of the Institute of Public Affairs. For 78 years, the IPA has been Australia's voice for freedom, democracy and the Australian way of life. We fight for freedom of speech, the power of the free market, an honest debate on climate change and the timeless value of Western civilization. We don't receive a cent of government funding and are not beholden to nervous advertisers. We speak out only because of the support of thousands of great Australians who are proud IPA members. And today we're asking you to join the IPA community. Sign up as an IPA member now and you'll receive a signed copy of Corkscrew, the brilliant novel written by The Spectator Australia's very own Rowan Dean. Now this is an entirely fictitious account of a certain young Australian's adventures as a hard-drinking, 
fast living, freedom loving advertising executive in 1980s London. As it happened, I took this book with me on a flight to London and I was laughing so hard that I disturbed the other passengers. I love this book and trust me, you will love this book too. And you'll get a free copy signed by Rowan when you become a member of the Institute of Public Affairs. Not only will you be supporting our work in defending freedom, democracy and the Australian way of life, but you will also enjoy exclusive benefits like priority access and discounts to IPA events, our quarterly magazine, the IPA Review, our weekly email roundup for freedom enthusiasts, Hey What Did I Miss, regular updates from Executive Director John Roskam offering his take on the tough, tough issues of the week. Policy updates from our gun research team giving you all that wonderful ammunition you need to own that lifting mate at your next insufferable dinner party and some merch as well, of course. So just head on over to ipa.org.au forward slash corkscrew, sign up today and join Australia's Voice for Freedom. Well, that's it for this special Easter edition of Counterculture right here on Spectator Australia TV. Leave a comment down below and let us know uh, what you think about anything we've talked about today or anything we haven't talked about, whatever's on your mind, because we always love to hear what you think. And as always, we'll be giving out another special mystery prize to the best comment. So sit down, have a think, and get those Spectator creative juices flowing. And remember to access all the content from the Spectator Australia. Just call 1800 809 233 and quote Spectator Australia TV. And finally, as always, remember to like this video, subscribe, share, set the notification bell, show it to your neighbours, do whatever you have to do, because every click helps us beat big tech censorship and get our message out. Have a happy Easter weekend, a great long weekend, and I'll see you next week, friends. Music